All right, I just want to thank the moderators and sages for the opportunity to come and give this talk. Um, I've been the tasked here with talking about endoscopic management of recurrent dysphagia uh, after hellermyotomy, and I have no disclosures for this. The uh, objectives are, I want to talk about, one, when we look at patients with recurrent dysphagia, what, are, what is the problem we're actually looking at, and that's going to guide our therapy. And then to just take a look at what is the role potentially for POEM as an endoscopic approach to make, doing myotomy and in these patients. Uh, just some of this is a little bit redundant with what he just said, but certainly Heller myotomy is the gold standard and it has excellent outcomes, but there are that 10% of patients early and as you get later out 20 and even pushing closer to 30% of patients who will have some dysphagia. And over time, over the last um, decade or so, there has been this increasing movement towards esophageal preservation rather than uh, esophagectomy for managing this dysphagia. Uh, the evaluation for this, I think, is really important to do a thorough and organized evaluation of uh, the patients when they come back and tell you that they're having dysphagia. And it probably starts with looking back at what was the original testing that was done, what was the original operation that was done, and get the details and make sure that they had achalasia in the first place and how the, whether there's anything technical that may have been uh, indicated, such as did somebody do a Heller and a Nissen, where the dysphagia would be from that. When you get to testing, I think upper GI is extremely useful, can show you what the clearance is. The pill study will show you does the tablet really hang up uh, at the GE junction and is there evidence of a strictured area there still. Endoscopy is mandatory. Certainly we know uh, that patients can get cancers or stasis, esophagitis, candidal esophagitis are all causes of that can be dysphagia that are fairly easy um, to manage, at least esophagitis, cancer, not so much. The, um, and then also, you can get a sense when you do this endoscopy is that if you have a narrowing in a, at the GE junction, does it seem like it's a muscular phenomenon or a recurrent achalasia phenomenon or is it a mucosal based stricture from reflux esophagitis because you're going to manage those very differently. Uh, manometry also, again, can be a little confusing in these patients, but it can show you is there a residual high pressure zone there to suggest recurrent uh, achalasia. And then pH testing uh, may be useful, I think, in some patients, but for the most part it can be difficult also to interpret because of fermentation and positive pH tests due to that. The, um, I put Botox injection here. I'm not really going to talk about it as a therapeutic modality, although I think it's there and it uh, exists in the same way as before. I do think sometimes doing, if in a patient who you're really not sure if a myotomy is going to be the answer, that doing a Botox injection up front and assessing response to that can be helpful in terms of your, your diagnostic workup and your assessment. So just touching again, so when you, after you do all this, when you look at the etiologies of, your, of the dysphagia, trying to determine mostly is this a mucosal or is it a, uh, a muscular phenomenon or a scarring phenomenon? And then also the other things, fund applications. If somebody had a Nissen, clearly you're going to need to take that down uh, to be sure you can relieve their... Uh, relieve the problem. And then if you see, the later you get away from your original Heller, the more you have to think about and be aware of uh, esophagitis and reflux as a, uh, as a potential cause. So this is a picture from a patient that I did a poem about a year and a half ago. And what my approach to that has always been to do the operation, and then I do a pH study at about six months after surgery because we found that about half of the patients will have reflux, and about half of the patients with pathologic reflux don't have any symptoms. So you get a very high silent reflux rate in these patients. She didn't come back and get her study. She turned up a year and a half later, never having taken a PPI, never having uh, re uh, reflux symptoms, and showed up with this stricture. So she had a very sort of fibrinous stricture there. She had a lot of stasis in the esophagus. And so when I see something like this, my approach is first ag aggressive acid suppression, try to heal the esophagitis. I do dilate them gently the first time to try to improve that clearance of the esophagus because the stasis, I think, this is really a vicious cycle that's worse than in most patients because you have the stasis on top of that reflux and they really get um, some bad esophagitis and strictures. But if you can get that 
opened up, treat their esophagitis, that over time you can get them back on a maintenance, uh, um, maintenance PPI and just manage them with serial dilations there. And then you can, this is where maybe a pH test ultimately might be warranted, is if you're having trouble getting that esophagitis to heal and you're thinking that you might have to take the patient, like somebody like this who didn't have a fundification, and go do a partial wrap, I would do a pH test in that uh, setting. So talking, just touching on then a little bit, recurrent achalasia. So if you have patients who you work them up and you think they really do have either a, that failed myotomy where they need to have repeat treatment for their achalasia, you sort of can start thinking about, can we manage this endoscopically with a pneumatic dilation? And you can. So this is a study that was from, uh, from Europe and France where they looked at their experience doing this. And so they had 18 patients who had failed Heller myotomy. They all had a good initial response to 30 millimeter balloon dilation. And then their protocol was on a symptomatic basis, you could go to 35 and 40 millimeter balloons and repeated dilations. So you see a early response rate, but also a very pretty large early failure rate. And most of the patients required more than one dilation. And so in this particular series, they didn't um, have any perforations, but I think you can extrapolate pretty easily to the data where we know if you keep doing pneumatic dilations at your rate and your risk of injury is going to go up. Although you can see there is a certain, about half of the patients do get a durable uh, long-term response to that. So I think that it's certainly something to keep in mind in patients particularly who can't um, tolerate general anesthesia or surgery, it is an option that can work for some people sometimes. And then to talk just about poems, the last thing I want to talk about here, the, over the last you know, few years, poem has really started to gain some traction and be done widely. Uh, and this has, can be done after a previous Heller. And I have a little video I'm going to show in a minute just about how that's done. But this, this is sort of the largest collection of data looking at that. So it's 90 patients who had previous Hellers, and they compared to 90 patients who had a primary poem. This is from 13 centers, both in the U.S. and in Europe. And when, from a technical standpoint of performing the operation, they really found no statistical difference in the, being able to perform the operations, but there were two patients who couldn't get the poem completed, and they were both due to submucosal scarring that was too aggressive to successfully make a tunnel. So there probably, there is some effect uh, there to that, and from my own experience, it is definitely a little bit more difficult, but it's certainly doable. So this was a patient who was kind of interesting because she had type 3 achalasia and underwent a heller and then had persistent dysphagia afterwards. And when her in her uh, esophagram, the, the tablet would hang up high in the mid-esophagus and then once it worked its way down distally, would move through the old myotomy very freely. So what we did was we made a very proximal mucosotomy about 25 centimeters from the uh, incisors and then get into that submucosal space. So you start the submucosal tunnel for the poem well above where anybody's been working before, so it's pretty easy to get into that space and develop it. And then as you move down towards the uh, GE junction, you do have to be careful and take your time because the mucosa does creep up there and does get um, stuck. But if you look, it was sort of as we make the tunnel, the space is available and it is doable. You just have to be um, a little bit careful. So here we're coming down and we're sort of working within the myotomized segment of the esophagus. Some people will advocate in doing this, doing a posterior myotomy rather than an anterior where it's been done before. I didn't do that. We went back to the anterior space. So we kind of went through the same, uh, through the same area and were able to do that without, uh, without too much difficulty. I've done a handful of cases like that and been able, been able to accomplish them all. Even if we're doing a distal myotomy, I would do that. So here you can see the cut edge of the, uh, of the previous myotomy and uh, where the myotomy was really complete coming back and as we keep coming back, eventually we see the intact circular layer and then the rest of this case, we actually did a long myotomy to meet that. But even if I was gonna do a redo, uh, poem for a patient after a heller due to what we thought was an incomplete gastric myotomy, I would still start fairly high above where anybody has been before, make that long tunnel, but then just work down at the level where we have always, uh, where we did the operation uh, the first time. 
Uh, so in this study, they looked at uh, the dysphagia. So I didn't mention with the balloon study. So both of these papers were classifying a, a clinical response as a Eckhart score of less than three after intervention. So for this, we, they saw an 81% improvement uh, in the patients who had had a Heller before and 94% in patients who hadn't. And so that actually lines up pretty well. Uh, you're going to get here a couple talks on Heller myotomy, but that data from an efficacy standpoint lines up pretty well with what we see uh, with revisional Heller. There were no differences in the adverse event rates. They were mostly low, uh, mild complications or inadvertent mucosotomies were the most common complication. The uh, one patient did have an esophageal leak and require a VATS, and that patient was in the, uh, in the Heller arm, but that was the only, uh, the only one. And then the, the um, post-procedure uh, reflux rates were similar. So whether you had a previous Heller or not, they still have pretty high reflux rates, 30%. 30 per, uh, 30 and most of those esophagitis patients are mild, grade A esophagitis. But certainly, like any of these patients, I think managing the um, reflux is a very important issue. And then as with most POEM studies that we've seen to date, there's a short follow-up interval here. So how does that do those um, clinical responses hold up over time? I think that just remains to be seen. I think certainly there's some, in some ways you can make an argument that getting to that area from a POEM approach may technically be easier in some patients, especially patients who have had open surgery for their Heller in the past, may provide actually an easier way to get where you're going than um, a laparoscopic or thoracoscopic approach. And also, the, you have to definitely consider that what you can do there is limited. So you can't take the previous fundoplication down. And so if you're worried that somebody has a hiatal hernia or a fundoplication related issue that may um, be contributing to their dysphagia, probably this isn't the way to go. But if they had a door before or they, you uh, are pretty sure that's okay, it might be a reasonable way to go. So just in summary, I think re uh, recurrent dysphagia does occur and is something we have to be aware of and continue to follow our patients long term after we do uh, Heller myotomies. I don't think it's an operation that people should just be sent back to where they came from and not uh, followed, so we need to follow them. Uh, the reflux needs to be managed, and we need to actively look for it because the silent reflux rate is high enough, and I think it probably is higher than we would think because of fundoplication failures in the Heller population, not just the poem population. So we should actively be looking for that and assessing it because they come back with such difficult problems when they come back. And then uh, I think there are endoscopic ways to deal with it. You just, I don't think any of them are a silver bullet. I think that you have to be very sort of thoughtful and considerate about who, how, and to, for whom you apply these. But that they, when you're dealing with a problem that's difficult, the more bullets you have in the chamber, the better off you are. Thank you.